Rayfield. It is another week ending at Rayfield. It is a fabulous Friday. And of course, we are celebrating health and wellness and all of the things that are important to us to spring forward at Rayfield, which is this month's theme. Well, we have a wonderful surprise. The Center for Disease Control and Feeding South Florida will be at Rayfield tomorrow for the pantry. And during that time, they are bringing with them the Pfizer vaccine. Congratulations, Rayfield, again. It seems like so many folks want to help us, help our community and our students. We are so proud as an agency to be able to help the community and reach out to those who are in need. Remember guys, we always say that just because we have a disability does not mean that we cannot be involved in helping others. We must be involved in helping others and volunteering and just being concerned and being friendly to those in our community. So again, Rayfield, we will be reaching out to the Hollywood community and beyond and offering the Pfizer vaccine. Now, as you know, guys, the Pfizer vaccine is two shots. So whoever receives that vaccine on tomorrow will return to Rayfield again to get the second dose of the vaccine. And this is being done by Feeding South Florida, the entity that helps us with our food pantry. And as you know, for the last 20 years, Rayfield Family Literacy has provided food to the community. And now, through the Pierce Street Church of Christ, we are doing the same. We're reaching out to our community, we are sharing with others, we are caring for others, and we're being Christ-like. Generous, gentle, patience, all of those fruits of the spirits that we have been learning about, we're exhibiting them to the community. So I'm not gonna talk much, I'm gonna let you enjoy this beautiful video of all of the vaccines that we've given out so far. It is a fabulous Friday. We are COVID free. We are springing forward at Rayfield. We are Rayfield strong. Let's have a fabulous, fabulous Friday.
to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched we're so gallantly streaming and the God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Thus be the reading of God's word coming from the book of Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell it therein. For he had founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his souls unto vanity, nor sworn deceitful, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seeketh him, that he that seeketh thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up thy heads, O ye gates. And, ye, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. <coughs> Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory <coughs> shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory, Selah. Join me in a word of prayer at this moment. <coughs> Merciful Father God, we give thanks, praise, honor, and glory, God, to your holy and divine name, God, for 
all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will continue to do in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you this day, dear Lord, for all of your great blessing. We thank you, God, for your mighty works. We pray, God, that you will continue to bless your people. Continue to be a blessing unto them in their incoming and their outgoing. Continue, Father God, to, to bless each and every one of us, God, as we struggle to this time. <clears throat> and in the seasons of, of our despair, Father God, may we continue to lean upon you and to call upon your holy name, Father God, that you may grant us the blessing that we stand in need of. For we know not any other God but you to trust and obey. Father God, we pray, God, that you will continue to heal the sick, continue to heal the shedding. Bless all them, God, that are standing in need of prayer right now, Father God. Continue to bless each and every one in the mighty name of Jesus. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. We are still learning our Bill of Rights. Oh, whoa. We have a right to vote. I have a right to vote. I have a right to see a doctor. I have a right to go to church. I have a right to humane discipline. I have a right to community outings. I have a right to talk. I have a right to education. I have a right to refuse treatment. I have a right to privacy and dignity. I have a right to make money. I have a right to exercise. I have a right to... Oh, sorry. I have, I have a right, right to see my records. records. I have a right to own possessions. I have a right to receive services. I have a right to no discrimination. I have a right to no physical harm. We're talking about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, on Resurrection Sunday, is about what res Now you're asking yourself, what is resurrection? What is the resurrection of our of our Lord? The resurrection have have when Jesus was crucified, was buried, and he rose again from the dead. In three, two, one. The resurrection of Jesus took everybody by surprise. The disciples weren't expecting it. They knew perfectly well if you followed somebody who you thought was the Messiah and he got killed, then that was it. We know of at least a dozen other messianic or prophetic movements within the hundred years either side of Jesus. They routinely ended with the death of the founder, um, and if they if the movement wanted to continue, they didn't say, oh, he's been raised from the dead. They said, let's find his brother or his cousin or somebody who can carry on this movement. We can see how those Jewish groups did that. This one did it differently. They had James, the brother of Jesus, as this great leader in the early church. Nobody said James was the Messiah. They said Jesus was the Messiah. Why? He's dead. He, they, they got him. Didn't you realize they crucified him? No, he was raised from the dead. The only way you can explain why Christianity began and why it took the very precise shape it was is, let's say it cautiously first, they really did believe he was bodily raised from the dead. And then if you take the second question and say, why would they believe that? You can go through all the theories that they found themselves forgiven, that they had a fresh sense of the presence of God, that this was cognitive dissonance, etc. And you bring all those theories to the actual facts that we know on the ground from the first century, they just don't fit. The only way you can explain the rise of the early Christian belief that Jesus was raised is that there really was an empty tomb, they really did meet Jesus alive again in a transformed body, and the thing makes sense. Of course, when I wrote a big book on this, 
my philosophy tutor from Oxford, who was an atheist, um, uh, read it, and he said, great book. You really make the argument. He said, I simply choose to believe that there must be some other explanation, even though I don't know what it was. I said, fine, that's as far as I can take you. I can't bully you into saying, therefore, you must believe, because to do that requires a change of worldview. But once you change the worldview and say maybe there really is a creator God and maybe this creator God really is sorting out this sad old world at last, then everything else makes sense in a way that it doesn't with any other possibility. They deceive, they're gullible, they are naive and as such they get caught up easily. The, the silly fool now is a little bit different. A silly fool is that, that hard-headed person uh, whose mouth and their anger gets them in trouble. They despise wisdom because they think that they, uh, their way is uh, the only way of, of thinking. Now, that's a silly fool. But the sensual fool is a lot deeper than that. A sensual fool does not have a, a mental deficiency. It's not that that person or he does not know. A sensual fool knows but rejects the wisdom of God. And it shows through their action. And not only do they reject uh, the wisdom of God, a sensual fool takes pleasure in doing uh, what is wrong in the sight of God. A, simple, a, a sensual fool is someone that delights in uh, being hard-headed or being disobedient. And again, the Bible speaks about this. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 23. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 23. You got the simple fool, the silly fool, and now we're talking about the sensual fool. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 23. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 23. Look at what the Bible says. It is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of wisdom, but a man of understanding has wisdom. It is a sport. That means they take the light in doing wrong, doing the wrong thing, doing evil. Take the light in it. That's a sensual fool. That means they get pleasure from doing the wrong thing or doing evil or doing mischief. They get pleasure from that excitement. That's a sensual fool right there. Now, the fourth type of fool is a scorning fool. Now, not only does this person reject truth, um, wisdom, and understanding, they actually look at uh, those who represent truth, wisdom, and understanding, they look at them with disdain and, and, and contempt or scorn. And it's important to understand that this type of person is a dangerous person because they have no respect for the things of God or the people of God. Turn over to Psalms 1 and verse 1. Psalms 1 and verse 1. This type of person, this type of fool is one that the Bible declares that we must make sure that we avoid. Psalms 1, verse 1. Look at what the psalmist says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the what? Scornful. This is the person that has not only uh, rejected the truth, of God, the wisdom of God. This is the person that uh, delights in uh, talking bad about the things of God. Oh, y'all silly for, for going to that church or for believing in that God, so on and so forth. They, they look at uh, people of faith with disdain or scorn or even the things of God with scorn. And, and this is, a like I said, this is a dangerous person. Because the Bible says a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that means I often say the person that, that, that says that there is no God is often the most dangerous person on this earth. 
because they uh, they have no sense of accountability. They can say what they want to say. They can do what they want to do. Who's going to check them? There is no God, so I have no fear. I have no reason to control myself or to do what is right. Who am I? Who do I have to answer to? That's a, a show enough fool. And that leads me to the last type of fool. The fifth is the steadfast fool. Hmm. A steadfast fool is that person that has determined in their heart, I don't care what y'all say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to uh, say what I want to say. That's a steadfast fool. And I like to call him a show enough fool. And again, when we look through the skip scripture, the Bible has a lot to say about the different types of fool. And you and I, when we look at Proverbs, and I quoted this one earlier, you turn over to Proverbs chapter one, and you see a description what the Bible says is a, a show enough fool or a, a steadfast fool. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's a show enough fool right there. A fool despises wisdom and instruction. And God is often trying to get us to repent and to turn to him and to see wisdom and to Hear him crying out, hear wisdom crying out. But a fool, a steadfast fool will reject that and is determined to do what he wants to do. And to think about it, the only thing that corrects a steadfast fool, a scorning fool, and a sensual fool is punishment and discipline. Now, a simple fool and a silly fool they can increase in knowledge and understanding and that will allow them and cause them to, to change their ways because all they need is a little more discernment and wisdom. But the sensual fool, the scorning fool, and the steadfast fool, those individuals, the Bible declares, they have to suffer some things in order uh, to, to, to change their ways. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26 and, and verse number three. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse number three. The Bible says, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. <laughs> and again, when you look at the etymology of the word fool in this context, you can see it's, it's a lot different than just somebody who doesn't know, you know, uh, or lacks understanding. This is describing a, a sensual fool, a scorning fool, or a, a steadfast fool. He said, the only way you can correct them, a rod to the back. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a, a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. <laughs> There's so much that the Bible has to say about the fool, but the consequences are all the same. Suffering, punishment, but God has a solution. And that's why Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21 is so uh, critical for us to understand. Because you have a man here who is blessed by God blessed beyond measure, but we can see that he was a fool based on the things that he did. He got caught up in the pleasures and the, and the, the material things of life. But the most important thing that he did, which a fool does, especially a sensual, a scorning, and a steadfast fool, he forgot about God. And ladies and gentlemen, we must make sure that no matter how blessed we are. Let us never forget where our blessings come from. Let us never forget to, to keep God first in our hearts and, 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 and use the blessings that he gives us to be a blessing to others. That fool in Luke chapter 12, 
had no regard for, for, for God. And not only did he have no regard for God, he lacked that wisdom and that discernment to know that, you know, death is everywhere. We could be, uh, tomorrow is not promised. Even though he was, he had built a bigger barn, he's laying up his treasure, his confidence, his security was based in his material things. I got a lot of money. I got a lot of this. I got all these goods. So I am secure. But he forgot about his relationship with God. He neglected the thing that matters the most. It's not the material thing. It's not the, the, the how big the house is. It's not how big your, your bank account is. It's rather or not you have a relationship with God. So as we say, thank God, it's Friday. As I said earlier, TGIF means today God is first. And so I want to encourage you to declare that in, in your spirit. Don't be a fool. Each and every day that God allows you to see, declare in your heart, in your mind, be fully persuaded that today God is first. He's going to be first in my actions, in my thoughts. I'm going to consider him in my decisions and, and how I treat folks. Today, God is first. Don't be a fool. Put God first each and every day of your life. Don't be a simple fool. Don't be a silly fool. Don't be a sensual fool. Don't be a scornful fool. And please, don't be a steadfast fool. Because each one of those, even though they're different in subtle ways, all have the same consequences. They wind up suffering. And you can avoid a lot of suffering if you remember to keep God first. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you bless us to be able to see. Kind Father, we thank you for life, health, and strength and allowing us to open our eyes to experience this day we've never seen before and we will never see again. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We recognize that we are here today not because we have been so good, but because you're so good. You're merciful, you're gracious, you're kind, you're compassionate, you're ever loving, Father not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And as we awake to a new day, Father, we, we ask, kind Father, that you will just continue to be merciful unto us and lead God and direct our steps as we go through this day, Father. Father, we pray that you will always uh, help us to be mindful of, of you, your presence, and your word. Help us not to forget uh, that God is real, that you are real, and you reward those who diligently seek him, seek you. Father, help us to remember that as we are blessed, that you give us the ability, the, the power to get wealth, Father. You give us our mind, you give us our skills, you give us our opportunities uh, to get wealth, Father. So you are the source of our resources. May we never forget that, Father, and may we never forget you. Help us not to be a fool, Father. Whether it's a silly fool or a simple fool, a sensual fool, a scornful fool, or a scorning fool, or a steadfast fool, whatever it is, Father, no matter what type of fool it is, Father, help us to be mindful of our thoughts. Help us to be mindful of our words. Help us to be mindful of our actions so that you won't have to declare just as you did for the band in Luke chapter 12. Declare that he is a fool. Father, help us to do uh, what is right in your sight. Help us to, to keep you first and declare every day uh, that you bless us to see that today God is first. Father, we ask that you just watch over us as we go through this day. Forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. Oftentimes, they can be many, Father, but we again, we beg for your mercy and your forgiveness. Give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to, to do your will today, to, 
to stand and resist the devil and the temptations that come our way. Help us to stand on your word and do what is right in your sight, Father. Because we know your word teaches us if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. And there are some right now, Father, who have been tempted and, and challenged and, and even attacked by the enemy, Father. And they may be feeling a little bit discouraged. Help them, Father, to persevere and hold to your unchanging hand. Because this too, whatever it is they're going through, this too shall pass. And Father, we pray that you will hear our prayers today. There are some, Father, right now who are, are, who need your mercy in their in their lives, Father. There are some who are sick, Father, whose bodies are ailing and aching this morning, who are dealing with diseases and very various ailments of the body. But Father, you created us, and we know you have the power to heal our bodies. And we pray in Jesus' name that you will heal those who are joined with me in this prayer group, Father. Not only those, but those that we are requesting prayer for. Uh, who are sick, Father, in the hospital, in their homes, in the, uh, the, the the rehab centers, wherever they may be, Father, we ask that you will send your healing power, release your healing power into their bodies right now and restore them back to the normality of health and strength so that we can once again uh, witness your glory and how you take care of those who trust in you. And Father, as always, we want to remember those whose hearts are heavy this morning, who are grieving because they suffered uh, the loss of a loved one. Father, I'm so glad that we don't have to walk this, this journey alone, Father, but you promise to never leave us or forsake us. And especially those who are of the household of faith, Father, we pray that you will comfort those who are grieving right now, who are trying to uh, adjust their lives uh, to living without their loved one. Help them to know that you are always there with them, Father. You will give them the strength they need. When father and mother forsake us, you will take us up, Father. And I'm so grateful for that. And Father, we pray for those who not only, uh, who may not have suffered loss of a loved one, but maybe they lost their job. Maybe that relationship didn't work out uh, the way they wanted it to, Father, but their heart is hurting right now. We pray that you will send healing, Father, into their, their heart, Father, their emotions, Father. Heal them emotionally, heal them mentally, Father. Heal them spiritually so that they can know that they will get through this, Father. And that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Help them to know you haven't forgotten about them, Father. And you're right there with them, giving them the strength that they need to get through whatever it is that they're going through right now. And Father, we, we pray for your wisdom. We pray that you will give us the ability to discern how to apply the knowledge and the, and the understanding that you give us when to apply it, Father. Sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it, and even when we say it, Father. But if you bless us with wisdom, Father, we will follow your lead and make sure that we apply the knowledge and understanding in a way that glorifies you. Give us wisdom, Father, today. And Father, lead us in a way uh, that we might be a blessing to those around us. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our businesses. Thank you for our children, our, our loved ones, all those that you have placed in our lives, that we have the opportunity to influence for your glory. Help us to seize that opportunity, Father, and live in such a way that we may inspire others to know you. And Father, we continue to pray for this nation that we live in. We know, Father, that evil uh, persists in this world, but we know that your power is greater. And help us as your children, Father, to be the light of the world and the, and the salt of the earth, to, to use the influence and the opportunities that we have, Father, to exalt your name, to be of godly influence in an ungodly world. And most importantly, Father, give us the opportunity to tell others about Jesus that he is the good news that we need in bad times like these, Father. It is only through him, Father, that we can become connected to you to, to, find, uh, to have forgiveness of our sins and even be blessed with eternal life and, and be empowered with the presence of your Holy Spirit, Father. We need Jesus now more than ever. And so, Father, with the opportunity that you give us today, 
when you give us the opportunity to tell someone about somebody who can save anybody, give us courage to say something. Give us courage, Father, to, to share your word. And, and most important, importantly, Father, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for using us for your glory. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen. Don't be a fool. Don't be like this man that we read about in Luke chapter 12. Today, God is first. Declare it, mean it, live it, show it <clears throat> each and every day of your life. I pray that you all will have a fantastic Friday. Don't forget to join us on Sunday morning uh, at 9 a.m. Sunday School with Sean King, followed by our morning worship service at 10 a.m. Then we'll be back on on uh, Monday morning, if it is the Lord's will, with another conversation with God. You all have a blessed Friday and a great weekend. Take care. Good day, everybody. <clears throat> it's spring forward still. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have our virtual tour continuing about spring. Now, last week, if you remember, okay, we did some skydiving hmm, from really, really high altitudes and that was pretty cool and very uh exhilarating this week we're gonna do some more spring activities and they're gonna consist of a few things three different things <clears throat> one of them is hand gliding you know there's a contraption that is built very scientifically modeling the wingspan and position of birds, uh, particularly eagles, how they can glide through the air so gracefully and actually without moving their wings, just gliding with the air that's blowing, the wind that's blowing toward them, they can go higher or lower. So man was able to imitate this and create a sport called hand gliding. And we're going to watch all about that and get some instructions on how to do that. Okay. In addition to the hand gliding, there's something that's really cool that I have never done, but I want to do. And that's white water rafting. So we're actually going to go on the Colorado River with a few people in a raft. And we're going to learn how to paddle. And we're going to get instructions on paddling and leaning back and standing forward and all the different maneuvers you have to do as a team in order to be able to uh, conquer the water. And we'll get splashed on, so make sure you're wearing your bathing suits. And uh, the third item is going to be a surprise. Actually, we, uh, I'm going to tell you. We're going to visit this aquarium and we're gonna learn all about uh, the special turtles that are out there. And um, that's quite interesting. So these are three beautiful spring activities that uh, I'm sure you're gonna love and get excited about while watching them. So don't forget, take your backpack, take some water, take your bathing suits and uh, you may want to take a helmet if you have it. Remember, we're going to go hand gliding high in the air, just like an eagle. All right, guys. So let's enjoy this. And without further ado, we're going on our virtual tour. My name is Taryn McGinnis. I'm the manager of the education department here at Marine Land Dolphin Adventure. And we're gonna take you on a little tour so that you can see all of our animals and learn about some of the work that's happening here, even if you can't be with us in person. Right now, we're in Neptune Park and we're standing in front of one of our sea turtle habitats where Rocky the loggerhead sea turtle lives. Rocky has been with us for about five and a half years. He came to us after a really, really severe boat strike accident. 
His original medical care happened for him at Moat Marine Lab. And then once he was stable, he was brought over here to us for his long-term care. At first he required regular wound treatment and pain management. But as you can see, he's doing so much better. He's big, he weighs about 250 pounds. He's around 20, maybe 22 years old. He is not even close to full grown. Loggerhead sea turtles can get up to about 400 pounds. And as he's healing, it looks like there's only gonna be one real lasting impact of that boat strike injury. And unfortunately that is that the boat strike to his head damaged his optic nerve and he can't see out of one eye. So for now, that makes him a poor candidate for release. Um, that may change, but for now, we are happy to give him a home, continue with his regular care, and let him inspire people as they come to meet him. All right, so now we are over here by Pokey, who is our Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. Completely different from the loggerhead sea turtle, a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle is actually the most endangered of all the species of sea turtle, also the smallest. So whereas Rocky the loggerhead was 250 pounds and not even full grown, Pokey is 90 pounds and he is full grown. He's 35 years old and his story is really unique. He was part of a program called the Head Start Program, which was a conservation effort for Kemp's Ridley sea turtles happening in Texas in the 1980s and the goal of this program was to go and collect wild sea turtle eggs um, incubate those eggs hatch them and then feed really good food to the hatchlings and just grow them past the size where everything wanted to eat them right sea turtle hatchlings are small and everything sees them as food and then release them back out into the wild and so this was happening in the 1980s off the coast of Texas um, and so when Pokey was collected all of this happened he was he was hatched but as soon as he started walking the people taking care of the sea turtle hatchlings could tell that he wasn't moving quite Quite right and it turns out that Pokey has a degenerative bone disease that affects the strength of his bones and also his shell so um, he requires regular medical care and treatment and um, so he was never released along with all of his siblings who were who were released as part of that program so we've got uh, Pokey for the rest of his life he's doing really well and one of the great things about Pokey is that besides that bone disease he's completely healthy and um, he is actually been able to donate blood to other Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. So for instance, when um, the sea turtle hospital has received a, um, an, a sick Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, we had a case recently where a sea turtle came in and she had pneumonia and she needed a blood, a blood transfusion and Pokey was able to donate the blood for her. So he's really a superhero and been able to do great things with his life. Um, and that's not even getting into all the inspiration that he that he brings to young people who get a chance to meet him and learn about his story and, and what he's done, what he's been through, and what he continues to do for, for sea turtle conservation. So one of the things that's really special about Pokey here is that his shell is very sensitive and he really seems to enjoy rubs and scratches and tickles and whenever the team of aquarists come out to clean his habitat using a scrub brush he'll wiggle himself in front of them so that he can get scrubbed with the brush so over here we've got our four sand tiger sharks that are here as part of a cooperative reproductive research program and one of the interesting things about sand tiger sharks is that they do very, very well in aquariums. And they're very popular in aquariums because they look so sharky. They've got all these teeth sticking out of their mouth. They're actually related to great whites, so they've got this very dominant presence. They do very, very well in aquariums, but there has yet to be a very successful breeding program in any aquarium. And one of the thoughts is that as aquariums get um, more controlled where everything can be monitored to make sure that it's best for the animals and the lighting is controlled and the temperature is controlled and the salinity of the water is controlled. One of the things that we're losing in some places is the absolute uncontrollable variability that nature provides. And one of the theories is that maybe it's somewhere in that variability that the triggers come from for breeding. And so this facility is actually the only sand tiger shark habitat in the world that is both outdoors and uses straight ocean water. 
So there are all these different facilities that are interested in sending their sharks down here to be part of a really, really interesting program to try and determine whether being outside, experiencing the changes of photo period, the changes of air temperature, the changes of water temperature that all come from being in an outdoor facility may trigger breeding. So periodically, all the stakeholders, all the veterinarians, all the scientists, all the researchers, all of the aquarists from facilities all around the world will come here and we will do health assessments with these sharks and we can do ultrasound exams and we can take blood samples, look at the hormone levels. And what we really wanna learn more about is what triggers breeding, what these animals need for breeding. And then ultimately, the way that that can help sharks in the wild, because this is a depleted species. This is a species of shark that um, fishermen around here will tell you they used to see all the time and it's much less common nowadays. And unfortunately, one of the reasons for that is that sand tiger sharks are very popular with the shark finning industry. And there's not a ton of limitations put on that right now. But if through developing a breeding program, we can start to learn, look, females only become reproductively mature at this age. And then they only have this many babies. And then they have to wait this long before they can have more babies. And then they stop becoming reproductively active at this age and we can start to put some real data and some real numbers behind their reproductive activity, we can show that with unlimited hunting and unlimited shark finning on this species, we're dooming them to extinction. So really, this is a, this is a program that's not just about breeding for aquariums, but really about how we can protect sharks in the wild. So stay tuned, because we're hoping for some excitement to come here in the, in the months and years to come. So here we are in our 1.3 million gallon bottlenose dolphin habitat. And uh, we have 15 dolphins living here. And this is where really the magic at Marine Land happens. This is where our dolphin interactive programs uh, take place. And this facility here was built in 2006. Marine Land has been here since 1938, and we'll talk more about our history. But this facility was really specifically designed so that people can get up close and personal with our animals. And the goal is to get people in the water with the dolphins, because there's no more immediate way to develop a connection with an animal and to be inspired by the animal than to be able to have a, a hands-on interaction. So if you come to Marine Land, you will see people in the water with the dolphins. You can be in the water with the dolphins as well. And our water comes directly from the ocean. And part of that is historic. This is actually back in 1938 when Marine Land opened. Nobody had figured out how to make ocean water by mixing fresh water and salt and chemicals. So all aquariums that required salt water needed to pump it in from the ocean. And that's why Marine Land is located where it is now. And back then they developed actually a water intake system that brought water in directly from the ocean and pumped it into the animals. And we still use that system today. So you can see the dolphins are playing with a bunch of toys right now and you know one of the things everybody loves about dolphins is how playful they are. Um, and out in the wild, if you see dolphins in the Flagler County beaches, um, you'll see them doing the same thing. Now what they might be playing with out there is something different. They, maybe they found a piece of driftwood or who knows, a piece of seaweed, um, but the behavior is the same. And we have dolphins here ranging in age from young, just maybe a few years old, all the way up until their early 50s. Despite their age, everybody loves to play. Now, some fun facts about these guys. These are bottlenose dolphins. There are so many different species of dolphin, but the dolphin we have here is the common bottlenose dolphin, and the dolphin that you see in the ocean from the Flagler County beaches are also bottlenose dolphins. So this is our local species as well. And um, here's some fun, fun things to know about them. Uh, if you look in their mouth, you're gonna see lots of teeth. In fact, these guys typically have between 72 and 104 teeth in their mouth. But they don't chew their food at all. They don't tear their food apart at all. So what do they use all those teeth for? Well, think about what they're eating. It's fish, right? And the fish are wiggly and they're slimy and they wanna get away. So those teeth are really great because they form a perfect trap. And in fact, the dolphins have big spaces in between their teeth, in between the teeth in their upper jaw and in between the teeth in their lower jaw. And when their mouth comes together to close, 
those teeth fit right in between in those spaces and that forms a perfect trap. So those wiggly slimy fish cannot get away. So dolphins are really spectacular hunters. They're really great at catching their food and that's the way that they develop that big fat blubber layer that they've got. So on those cold days when you don't want to get in the water because the ocean feels way too cold for you, these guys are loving it. That blubber layer is the perfect insulator and it's just blubber is just good dense body fat and it comes from eating lots of fish. But you know what they specifically like to hunt for and are good at hunting for? Fish that make noise. Dolphins hear very well, they use sound a lot and so fish like croakers that make a noise are going to be the ones that dolphins find first. So if you're a fish, shh, be quiet. So here we are in our behind the seas area. So when you're down here, there's all different kinds of fish and invertebrates. We've got terrapin as well, all species who live right here in this area. One exception to that is that we have lionfish and they are here, certainly not as an example of a native species, but as an example of an invasive species. So this is a really great opportunity to see these animals and to learn more about what happens when an animal who doesn't belong in our local waters ends up there. So lionfish belong in the South Pacific and you can usually find them out in the wild around, around Australia. And that's where they live. And they've got natural predators there. Look at how cool they are. They really are wonderful in people's home fish tanks. They're so exotic and, and interesting looking. But when they get big, a lot of times people don't want them anymore. And unfortunately, some folks dumped their fish that they didn't want anymore into the ocean. And we started seeing lionfish down in the Caribbean, the Florida Keys, up the Atlantic coast, and now we're seeing them even north of us. And unfortunately, none of our predatory fish see them as food. They don't recognize these guys. So their numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're overpopulating some of our native species. So Marine Land is really old. Actually, this summer we'll be celebrating our 82nd birthday. And uh, so lots of longevity here, lots of things living a long, long time here. And uh, none of those more famous than Nellie. Nellie was a dolphin who was born here in 1953 and she lived to be 61 years old, which is absolutely record setting for a bottlenose dolphin. Um, her son and grandson still live here today. Um, and she's actually the dolphin that the Jacksonville University mascot dolphin was based on. So as you can see, she earned many, many honorary degrees from the Jacksonville University. And also on her 60th birthday, she was given a jersey by the Miami Dolphins. So Marine Land Dolphin Adventure, which is our name now, we actually opened as Marine Studios in 1938. And the reason for that unique name is that we actually opened to really be an underwater film studio. In 1938, there weren't underwater cameras and scuba diving hadn't been invented yet. So how did you get underwater footage if you needed that for your movie? It was really, really difficult and very expensive. And so the founders of Marine Studios thought, well, hey, if we build a huge, almost a million gallon tank with multiple stories and windows all the way around that you could film through and fill that giant tank with all the different animals of the ocean, then movie makers could come, film through the windows, get footage of sharks and dolphins and fish and sea turtles. It would look as if they'd really been filming in the ocean and this would be such a great business venture. So that's exactly what this facility was built for. In the 1930s, we were gonna move Hollywood here to Florida. We built this beautiful facility. There was the circular oceanarium, there was the rectangular oceanarium. They were connected by a, by a small flume filled with ocean water and dolphins and sharks and turtles and fish lived here. There was over 200 porthole windows that you could look through and that you could film through. And one of the things that made this facility very unique is that all those animals were living together. There were certainly aquariums already at that time in our history, but an aquarium keeps different animals together. So you might have your fish over here and a shark exhibit over there and a sea turtle exhibit over there, but an oceanarium, 
we were the world's first oceanarium, brings all those animals together. Because of course, if you're making a movie and you want your footage to look like you had filmed it in the ocean, you need all your animals together because that's the way they live out there. So, Marine Studios, the world's first oceanarium, was built to be an underwater film studio. The day that it opened and locals were invited to come on out and see what this big construction project had been, local residents, local politicians, local media, this was actually June 23rd, 1938, came out to see what was going on here before we got down to the business of making movies. And you know what? 30,000 people showed up. We were not expecting that. And those people didn't come because they wanted to watch a movie being made. They came because they wanted to be able to see the animals up close. Even the folks who lived right here in Flagler County and in St. John's County, even though they lived right near the coast, they had never seen most of these animals. And a lot of people were very afraid of the ocean and of the animals who live in the ocean. And this was the first chance to see these guys up close and to see how beautiful they were and how graceful and funny and entertaining. And really from that day forward, first and foremost, we were an educational facility, a research facility, a place where people could connect with the ocean animals and fall in love. But we always were open for making movies as well. Revenge of the Creature was filmed here. Um, that's a great one. We had a movie theater here actually that showed a 3D movie that was filmed right here. And over the years, movies and television shows um, and newsreels were all filmed here, commercials. Timex had the first waterproof watch and they made a commercial here by giving the watch to a dolphin and having her drag that watch all through the water. And when it came up, it took a licking, but it kept on ticking and that was filmed right here. So lots of, of, of great filming really did happen here at Marine Studios, even as it evolved into an educational facility. In fact, just this year, Bernie the Dolphin came out and that was filmed here as well. Thank you all so much for joining us on this virtual tour of Marine Land Dolphin Adventure. We hope you learned a little something that maybe you didn't know before about our sea turtles and our sand tiger sharks, and of course our dolphins and our behind the seas area. And maybe we got you a little excited for coming back when this is over and we can open our doors to you again. We really can't wait. And just know that in the meantime, if you stay connected through our social media, you will see all our animals and the dedicated people who take care of them doing their jobs every day. And um, we miss you and we'll see you soon. <laughs> oh yeah, wet butt. One butt cheek right here, one butt cheek right here, half on half. Okay. So the way I want you guys to hold yourself in is with your feet. <laughs> oh yeah.
rocking forward and rock back as you pat it. All right. There you go. And I'll call a number of strokes in which direction. Normally three four to three back. That's good. All off on the battle. Now, now watch me. This is what we're going to call the surfing position. All right. We're going to do a good bit of surfing today. When we paddle back into these waves and we surf the waves out with water splashing all over us. And it's one of the funnest things to do while you're on a raft. And so we'll get crazy and get soaking wet. You can have a chance of falling out of the boat. <laughs> all right, y'all watch me. So the way we do this is throw your secrets between your legs, just like this. Get your feet together and out front. Fall forward with your butt on the floor and knees in your chest. Just like that, all the way to the ground, guys, all the way to the bottom. Now, more, most important part of this trip. Y'all ready? Y'all ready to hear the most important part of this whole trip? Ready. It's called high siding. Y'all watch me. If I yell, left, 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 or right, 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 you got to jump to that side quickly, dramatically, to keep this boat from flipping or to keep from falling out. Y'all watch me. If I say right, 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 you're going to jump over this right tube. Reach around, grab the water, put all your weight over it on this tube. Jump on top of your neighbor. If I say left, 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 jump on top of your neighbor. Reach all the way over the tube. All right, that's good. Hop up. Up, 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 up. And three forward. Go. One. Oh, man. <laughs> three more. Three. Clench my toes tight. All right, too far. We're too. <laughs> I don't think it's. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone forever. Yeah, <laughs> See, they're still trying to recover, dudes. <laughs> Those boots. Oh yeah, you, you know those boots are heavy now. <laughs> the glasses, that's good. You don't want to go in the water because it's glasses. Look, glasses. No one cares. I just got a slingshot line. I got an air dock. Yeah, you see, we, we got it on the... That seagull sucked a lot. What the fuck? You saw him? Oh. Yeah, I got I got you, like, flying through the air. Oh, yeah. Finally. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's cold. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's like constant. Oh. Ooh, oh yeah. Yep. 
<laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. oh yeah. Back one. And three forward. Oh yeah, you're gonna get it this time. <laughs> oh man, I'm stuck on that rock. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's a good wake up. Oh, oh man. Lean left, lean left. Lean right. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the water wasn't going down. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I'll try and clip it and send it to him. Maybe it's the cars. It could be the cars. Yeah. Kind of can't see any water past that bridge, so. <laughs> <laughs> and three. Yo. 
Yep. Shit, it sucks. Come on, buddy, come on. Oh, man, that was nuts, dude. <laughs> it's his, uh... Come here, buddy. Come here. 
That sucks. Holy crap, that was nuts! Yeah, were they expensive? Off on cattle, too. Were they expensive? Well, I almost felt like I was drowning. So I was oh, where'd you get? Where'd this one come from? You grabbed it? And that one's mine, this one's his. Oh, okay. Why did y'all stay in the boat? <laughs> we, yeah, we got fucking... Yeah. We got fucking... Yeah, someone fell oh, in my head. Oh, shit. You okay? You all I right? have a concussion. That was one of y'all's paddles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was out of my control. Damn. You good? It hurts a lot. Yeah, you got a big knob on Holy your head. Shit. Holy oh. shit. Dude, how did y'all stay in the boat? I literally... I, just, I was just doing like yeah. this. <laughs> I got... Because my... <laughs> <laughs> you should have felt like I went like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The helmet. You... I was all the way back. The helmet hit my helmet. Oh, oh damn. That is nasty. <laughs> I don't even want to look at it. Really cute. Yeah, it is. What's up, guys? I felt like I was like, I felt like I was like, I was underwater and the rappers were keeping me under. I was like, oh my god. No, no the life jacket was like, it was just on my head and I was just like, I'm good, I'm good. It just snapped back and you guys got launched. Did you lose your Dude, I had to not drown, bro. <laughs> yes, I lost my paddle. Are you serious, boy? Yes, I almost drowned. No in a good way. Though. No, that's the paddle right there. Unless you had two. Did you have two? Oh, this is it, it, yeah, whoever had this paddle is the only one. Alright, that. Mm. Like that. Yeah, I had to mine off. That was mine, so you lost your paddle. No, I, no, I lost paddle. mine. Mine fucking launched. Oh, this, one's, this one's yours. He's got mine. Yeah, it was it was good for me, but not so much everyone else. <laughs> no, I know was No, you're still scared. Crap. Did anybody get a chance to flip out of the boat? No. No. I was getting too. I had to record. <laughs> Okay, welcome to Darren Brown Extreme Sports. And the more observant of you might notice that um, Darren Brown is looking very um, youthful and good looking today. And um, so yeah, guest star in Tim Swate today, that's me. Um, largely because as you look around, you can see it's not a brilliant day. It looks very stable. Literally nobody is climbing, not seen a single paraglider. <laughs> Or hang well, there's no other hang gliders that we've seen in the air, and none of the paragliders seem to be going up. So I think today's going to be a top to bottom, pretty certainly. So Darren's just going to drive the car down. Um, he's um, handed all his camera and filming gear over to me, so I'm going to be doing some filming for you and um, taking you through what's probably just going to be a sled ride to the bottom. So we're on the Hobold launch in Interlaken. The lane bottom landing field which I'll be landing in is just over the edge there so very easy to get to from here. It's quite a shallow launch and as you can see there's almost no wind at all on it. In fact it's a little bit switchy and every now and again you get a slight breeze from the back but mostly it's coming up the front. Um, all, the, all the paragliders including the tandems are getting off fine but no one's actually really climbing they're all having to run a lot so it's going to need a very committed good run today. I'll probably try and go round to the right where we went yesterday and did get thermals from so I'll go and have a look round there see if there's anything working um, if there is then maybe I'll get up but um, I'm not putting much hope on it and then I'll head down to the bottom landing field and talk you through it all the way down 
So when you see hand glider pilots standing around on launch, not doing anything, waiting to go, there's a few reasons why that might be. First off, it might just be the pilot is what we call a faffer. Secondly, it might be because they're waiting until it's safe to launch, until the wind's blowing up the hill, which is fine at the moment, it's perfectly safe to launch. Thirdly, they might be waiting to try and maximise their chances of hooking into a thermal and going up, So, which is what I'm doing at the moment. I'm watching what other people are doing, trying to get a gauge for where the air might be working or not. So the key to doing a nil wind or very light wind launch on a fairly shallow slope like we've got today is first of all you really have to run but just as important as that is keeping pitch control of the glider. So what I'm going to be aiming to do is actually to be pulling the nose of the glider down to keep the glide, to keep my feet on the ground for as long as I can. So I don't want to be taking off with just enough airspeed. I want to have my feet on the ground to be really running and so I can let the bar go back to trim, go out to trim position and hopefully fly away with quite a bit of excess airspeed. A bit of extra energy gives you maybe a few extra metres altitude on a day like today which might matter and also it just makes the launch so much safer because you're coming away with a lot more energy when you're close to the ground. So now the only reason I'm not going is because of the paraglider right in front of me who looks like he's just about to go any moment now. I think he's a student, he seems to have an instructor instructing him. But there is quite buoyant air up there, so I'm quite keen to do it when I see the chance. Maybe you'll get a little bit steeper. Windsock's completely dead, Telltale isn't really doing anything. Telltale is coming up the slope, that's good. Wind sock's not really moving, but it's just about up. So at least we've got some headwind, no tailwind. That's dead again now. Looks like there's a little bit of a thermal, maybe just in front of the launch. Rubbish launch after just doing that briefing. To be fair, it was quite hard. But... So some beeps on the vario, but not actually gaining much. Have a launch on camera then. But now you've got to put that out of my mind, concentrate on the next stage, which is going to be trying to try and stay up. There was nothing in that gully, I turned around the back of it. Not going up at all. I've not got enough height to get back across this ridge, so I'm going to have to go out along it and around the end of the nose, which isn't the problem, I've got loads of pipes to do that with. But there's been no lift all the way along here. There's a paraglider turning over there, might actually be thermally. I've had a bit more buoyancy here, but it's not really going up. But there's a paraglider climbing quite strongly just over there. The problem is I haven't really got enough height to get across the ridge to get to it. And also not being very familiar with the topography of this place, I don't, I don't want to just dive that way over the edge and hope because I don't know what's over there. So I'm going to fly a bit more conservatively around it and hopefully still coming underneath where he's climbing. 
and I've still got the option to peel off that way if I need to, if I haven't got enough height to get around here. Oh, but there's some lift here, a bit buoyant. Not enough to turn in, but enough to just make this a bit more comfortable. Now committed to going round over the nose this way. That paraglider is actually got quite a nice thermal there, so it's worked out where it's coming up from the ground, maybe getting into it. His thermal was, it's just along here. The problem is, I'm up below the edge here, which makes it much harder to catch the thermal from when you're below an edge than above it. Yeah. No. Right, it's sinking worse here. We go back to where it was lifting. Uh, damn it, I've lost, lost maybe 100 feet on that feet. So, I think that little bubble there is about my only chance. there when we get back to it. Something, not much. It's giving me a bit of a kick into the hill, so maybe it's a bit stronger just out from the hill. about 100 feet, almost nothing, but it is stopping me going down anyway. So you know, notice I'm not flying close in to the trees today because it's the kind of day when it feels a bit rough and snarly and you don't know what's going to suddenly give you a kick in and up here in towards those trees so I'm keeping plenty of spacing out away from them. Oh, is that worth it? It's just these little bubbles which are quite enough to turn in. Yeah you see that's only 50 feet per minute. And it's rough and it's small. So there's no way I'll be able to work that. couple of paradigms in the bottom of the field that are fighting their wings around which is a bit annoying I mean I'm well high so no bother to me but oh, I'll put them down now that's good but yeah paraglider pilots please don't pop your wings up in the landing field even if you haven't noticed any hangies coming into land you never know there might be one you've not noticed if you pop your wing up right in front of them it's going to be very bad news for them at least those paraglides are giving me a good indication of the wind direction. So it's coming from the lake, so I'm going to be landing towards it. Looks from the wind sock like there actually is a little bit of wind there. So I don't think it's going to be a near wind landing. But I'm going to try and do a really big flare anyway, just to be on the safe side. I don't really know what it's going to do. It's maybe going to be a bit switchy as well. Oh, this is rough here, so yeah, maybe it will be. So I'll make sure I land nowhere near those guys in case they do that again when I'm coming in. VG set for landing. There's loads of pipes still, but I'm gonna unzip my harness just so I'm ready. We've got the big wind sock there, which is indicating some wind. There's a little light streamer there as well, which is a lot more sensitive as I get closer to 
field, I'll see that. Checking around that there's no one else coming into land. Only on the track I can see his paraglider a lot higher than me. Yeah, the stream is showing the same wind indication as the windsock. Ah, uh, the windsock's dropped now, that's not good. But the stream is still showing me, so I'm going to be landing towards the lake, but a bit down the slope as well, actually. I'm going to do a 360 over the landing field, just so I can keep my eye on that streamer and see if it switches at the last minute. I'll switch my landing approach direction. Uh, but I'm clearly drifting over the ground in the direction I thought I would, so that's a good sign. Into wind now. Turn down wind. Takeoff was absolutely shit. As I say, about the worst takeoff I've ever done, and it's all on camera now. So all the YouTubers can give me hell for that, probably rightly. Uh, but at least I nailed the landing, so that's something. And had a good go at getting up, even though I didn't. And you notice I'm clearing the field as quickly as I can. The paradise that was quite high above me did some crazy acro stuff and it's now just about to land. Okay, so um, just as a recap, so it wasn't exactly a good flight. It wasn't, wasn't one that I'll remember for years, except for perhaps that takeoff, which was pretty terrible. So yeah, a few things to learn from it though. So the first was that, um, as I say, I don't think I've ever done takeoff that's been that scary or that close before. And at least it's on, cat, on film, so I'm going to be watching that film and working out all the things I did wrong so I don't do them again. I can think of a few to start with. So the first one was because I was waiting behind a paraglider that wasn't launching when I wanted to launch. I was then too impatient that as soon as he had launched, I went, even though it wasn't really a particularly good point to have picked to, in the cycle to launch at that time. The wind was barely blowing up the hill if at all. I wonder if I even caught a slight bit of tailwind. Um, I think I did do a fairly good run. I'm not quite sure exactly what happened, so I'm gonna to have to watch the video to know. I know that I had a little bit of XP, excess speed left out, so I could actually just push out enough on the bar that I could convert some of that excess speed and didn't crash, but it was pretty close. So I definitely won't be doing that again. Uh, Next point to learn from, I think, as far as the circuit, as far as the staying up was concerned, I don't think it was really possible to stay up today, to be honest. I've not seen another paraglider or hang glider attempt to st um, stay up, so I think I'm pretty content that I went down. So I think going to the right was a mistake in hindsight, but it seemed like the right thing to do at the time, um, because then it meant that I came in on that ridge well below people that were paragliders that were just about maintaining above me so um, but I was too low to make use of it by then um, I think didn't take any unnecessary risks getting close into the trees um, it's kind of tempting to really try and hang on by your fingernails and scrape your wingtips through the trees and there are days when it's fairly you know the conditions are fairly benign um, that you can afford to get a little bit closer and then there's days like today when you could tell it was a pretty rough day actually and especially because if you look round that was the ridge that I was soaring and actually thinking about it now the valley wind is coming from that direction so it probably is curling slightly around that that edge and I think that explains why it was a bit bumpy in that corner and that's why I really didn't want to get close tight in there 
and then the and then the landing was uh, pretty good there was quite a bit of headwind so to be honest it was quite an easy landing anyway i did a really big flare just because uh you can see darren's very shiny insta 360 camera on there and i absolutely didn't want to be um whacking the nose and uh, whacking that into the ground so i did probably a bigger flare than i really needed to um but it worked out nicely nice landing and um, yeah so not an easy flight or a particularly one of the more enjoyable ones but um uh useful educational all the same good morning rayfield it is another week ending at rayfield it is a fabulous friday and of course we are celebrating health and wellness and all of the things that are important to us to spring forward at rayfield which is this month's theme well, we have a wonderful surprise. The Center for Disease Control and Feeding South Florida will be at Rayfield tomorrow for the pantry. And during that time, they are bringing with them the Pfizer vaccine. Congratulations, Rayfield, again. It seems like so many folks want to help us, help our community and our students. We are so proud as an agency to be able to help the community and reach out to those who are in need. Remember guys, we always say that just because we have a disability does not mean that we cannot be involved in helping others. We must be involved in helping others and volunteering and just being concerned and being friendly to those in our community. So again, Rayfield, we will be reaching out to the Hollywood community and beyond and offering the Pfizer vaccine. Now, as you know, guys, the Pfizer vaccine is two shots. So whoever receives that vaccine on tomorrow will return to Rayfield again to get the second dose of the vaccine. And this is being done by Feeding South Florida the entity that helps us with our food pantry. And as you know, for the last 20 years, Rayfield Family Literacy has provided food to the community. And now, through the Pierce Street Church of Christ, we are doing the same. We're reaching out to our community, we are sharing with others, we are caring for others, and we're being Christ-like, generous, gentle, patience, all of those fruits of the spirits that we have been learning about, we're exhibiting them to the community. So I'm not going to talk much. I'm going to let you enjoy this beautiful video of all of the vaccines that we've given out so far. It is a fabulous Friday. We are COVID free. We are springing forward at Rayfield. We are Rayfield strong. Let's have a fabulous, fabulous Friday.
Good morning or afternoon, Rayfield family. Here are your weather forecasts for this week. Monday, mostly sunny skies. A stray shower or thunderstorm is possible. High 84. Winds northeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Tuesday, partly cloudy skies. High around 80. Winds east northeast at 15 to 25 miles per hour. Wednesday, intervals of clouds and sunshine. High 81. Winds east at 15 to 25 miles per hour. Thursday, partly cloudy sky. High 83. Winds southeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Friday, partly cloudy. High 83. Winds south southeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Saturday, partly cloudy, high 84, winds south at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Sunday, mostly sunny sky, high 84, winds south at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Monday, sunshine and clouds mix, high near 85, winds south southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. These are your weather forecasts for this week. Keep your umbrella handy just in case we have rain in the forecast. Make sure that you keep updated with the latest weather forecast as it will change from time to time by either watching it from your television or listening to your radio or from any devices that carry their weather app. Thank you for tuning in, and may you have a productive week. See you later. to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rest. So gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag. Still there, oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free cultural festival in Harlem's? Mount Morris Park. 
Miss Simone sang the song To Be Young, Gifted, and Black by Lorraine Hansberry in the Civil Rights and it became a civil rights song. Miss Simone was involved in the civil rights movements with many famous people. She was involved in the movement with, with Mr. King, Martin Luther King. They marched to Montgomery Montgomery, Alabama, with Dr. King, also many others of the movement. Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, he was very young at the time. Sidney Poitier, John Lewis was there, of course. Adam Clayton Plower, Harry Belafonte, Al Sharpton, Andrew Young, Jesse Jackson, and at that time, our president was Johnson, President Johnson. And also during that time, James Meredith was shot. In 1974 to 1973, her recordings of Mississippi Goddamn harmed her career. The music industry pushed her by boycotting her records and that hurt her, and she was very disappointed. Miss Simone left the United States in 1970. She divorced her husband. Miss Simone traveled the world, Africa, Europe, England. Well, England and Europe, Europe, England is in Europe. She left her daughter with Malcolm X and the, Sh the Shabazz, his wife, Miss Shabazz. Her daughter's name is Lisa Simone Stroud. Her daughter is the one that's telling the story of her life. A beautiful young lady. Her daughter visited her when she was in Europe. Miss Simone became ill and died in Carrie Lee Root, France. April 21st, 2003. Doctor degree, a doctor's degree from Amherst College of Massachusetts, doctor of music degree. All her songs can be found on Pandora and YouTube. Also videos on YouTube and Nextflick. Nextflick was a complete story of Miss Nina Simone's life. She was a free spirit and a genius. She was an activist in the civil rights movements, young, gifted, and black. That's Miss Simone, Nina Simone, and that was her life. The life history being told by her daughter, of course, I said this already, Miss Lisa Simone Stroud. Thank you for listening. Anyone who's interested, she, go on Next Flick, and there's a wonderful movie about her with all her videos, her songs, her life, a picture of her daughter, her husband. Everything is there. You, you would enjoy it. I enjoyed it. And I wrote everything that I could from it. And I thank you again for listening. Let me write a song called Mississippi Goddamn. It was revolutionary. They didn't have cursing on the radio or on television or anything. DJs refused to play it. And boxes of the 45 used to be set back from the radio stations, cracked in two. Well, that's just the trouble. into high gear. She swung into high gear with it. And 65, 
We played the Selma March in Montgomery, Alabama. We have a legal and constitutional right to march from Selma to Montgomery. It was extremely dangerous. The federal marshals were called in, and they were standing on the tops of all the buildings. Good evening, this is Miss Joy coming to you from Rayfield School with some information about Mr. George Washington Carver. He was a plant scientist who made great contributions to the field of agriculture and chemistry. He created more than 300 products from peanuts, soybean, and sweet potatoes. Carver received many honors and awards for his work. Many institutions, museums, and museums and schools are named in honor of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was born in 1864 and he died in 1943. He was an African-American scientist and an educator. He was kidnapped as a newborn baby. He was known as the peanut man. We also have another person that's known as the peanut man. I'll tell you a little bit about him at the end of this. Mr. Carver attended and taught at many universities and institutions. Mr. Carver's special studies stemmed from his accomplishments and reputation as well as his degree from prominent institutions, not normally open to black students. Tus Tuskegee Institute, which is now a university, is one of the schools in which he taught and nationally renowned under Carver's leadership were many teachers and uh, faculties who he helped to move ahead. In Tux at Tuskegee Institute, they gave him the honor of being a leader in this institute. President Theodore Roosevelt sought him, sought his advice on agricultural matters in the US and the, the British Royal Society of Arts made him a member that was a very rare honor for the British to have uh, made him, give him that honor. Mr. Carver was also the national, the nutri I'm sorry, the nutritional advisor to Mahatma Gandhi. Jimmy Carter, our 39th president of the United States, of course, was also called the peanut man. In Plains, Georgia, Georgia, he he did he did peanut farming. So peanuts are a very important part of nutrition. President Carter is our oldest living president, 96 years old. Thank you. Good evening. This is Miss Joy. I'm coming to you from Rayfield School. I'm going to read to you something about our people that's in history, Black history. Her name is Miss Alice Walker. She was born in 1944. In her younger years, she was very involved in the civil rights movement. She became a writer and teacher of literature 
at Jackson State College. She wrote mostly poetry. In 1970, she wrote her best novel, The Third Life of George Copeland. In the 1970s, she taught at Wesley College and wrote many books and poems. In 1982, she wrote her most famous book, The Color Purple. This book won the Plutzer Prize, the American Book Award, and a National Book Critics Circle Award, Book Critics Circle Award nomination. Steven Spellsberg then produced the story as a movie and it received several Academy Award nominations. That's Miss Alice Walker. This is Miss Joy coming to you from Rayfield. I'm going to read something to you about Miss Wilma Rudolph. She's one of our famous black history person. This woman made incredible achievements in athletics. She was born into a family of 22 children. At the age of four, she suffered scarlet fever and polio. This left her weak and partially crippled. The doctor said she probably would never walk again. She worked hard to prove that the doctors were wrong. She did learn to walk again and later found that she loved to run in track and field events. At the age of 16, she won the bronze medal in a rally at the 1956 Olympics. In the 1960 Olympics, she earned three gold medals in the race that she ran. I'm, this is Miss Joy. I'm coming to you from Rayfield School with some news and information about some of our famous black women. This one you know very well. She's very popular, Miss Oprah Winfrey. This woman graduated from Tennessee State with a degree in speech and drama. She began working as a reporter and, and an anchor person in Chicago. She hosted a talk show in Chicago, which was syndicated nationally in 1986. This was the first time an, Afri an African-American woman has hosted her own national talk show. It is now the leading talk show in the country. She then created her own production company and named it Harpo Productions. In addition, she was Miss Black Tennessee in 1971 and was nominated for an Academy Award for her work in the film, The Color Purple. That was Miss Oprah Winfrey. Just a short few sentences about her life. We all know her. Thank you. Good evening, this is Miss Joy. Coming to you from Rayfield School, I'm going to read a few sentences to you about Mr. Duke Ellington. He was born in 1899, and he died in 1974. He is known as the greatest of all jazz composers and musicians. He wrote his first song at the age of 17. He went to the he went on to introduce the human voice as an instrument. Echo chamber, he used echo chambers 
to create sound effects. Add Cuban Latin elements to jazz and create the jungle sound. He played in the Cotton Club in Harlem from 1924 to 1927. He received the Grammy for his achievement in the music industry. Mr. Duke Ellington. Thank you. Good evening. This is Miss Joy, and I'm just going to tell you a little something about Mr. Jesse Owens. He's one of our famous African-American Olympians. Mr. Jesse Owens was born in 19... 13 and he died in 1980. This famous African American won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. He was born in Oakville, Alabama, but later he moved to Cleveland, Ohio. At Ohio State University, his athletic ability was recognized when, in 1935, he broke three world records. In his career, this man set seven world records. Thank you. Good evening. This is Miss Joy coming to you from Rayfield School with some information about our black women in history. This lady is called Miss Ida Wells. She was born in 1862 and she died in 1931. She was, she began working as a teacher, but she was dismissed in 1891 because of her militant resistance to segregation. She is best known for her anti-lynching campaign. In 1892, she became half owner of an African-American newspaper called the Memphis Speech, the Memphis Free Speech. In this paper, she strongly criticized the lynching of African-Americans. Her work was not limited to the anti-lynching campaign. She also organized the Black Women's Suffrage Organization, the National Afro-American Organization, the Committee of 40, which led to the development of the NAACP. Thank you.
Good morning, Raphael. We're going to continue our lessons on famous Afro-Americans, but we're going to shift our gear a little bit because March and part of February, I think, is also Women's History Month. So in order to fulfill a dual role of continuing learning about great Afro-Americans and great Americans all over the world, from every ethnicity, we're going to study a few women this month um, so that we can continue. Uh, we talked about last month the fact that we had such a phenomenal month and it was so great. We enjoyed it so much that we're going to continue talking about different people in the world and maybe you can relate to some of those people and maybe you can relate to some of the things that they've done and it'll help inspire you to understand and to know that you can do more and you can make an impact on this world also. So the reason why I'm dressed like this with my wrap, my shoulder wrap, and my headgear here, my hat, is this attire is from the 1800s. This is the type of attire that women wore back then. And so today I'm going to talk for a few minutes about a woman named Sojourner Truth. And then afterwards, I'm going to talk to you about Harriet Tubman. So first, let's talk about Sojourner Truth. And I have her picture here for you to see. Sojourner Truth was Freedom's Messenger, was her name, that's what everybody called her. And she was born in a place called Hurley, New York. The time that she lived was from 1797 to 1883, a long time ago. And this is how they dressed back then. Although Sojourner Truth was not an educated woman, she was a very wise woman. And the reason why she wasn't educated is because at that time, women were not allowed to go to school. However, she had an extraordinary gift of speech. She was born and her name, her name when she was born was Isabella. And later on, she changed her name. She was one of 12 children. Back then, families had big children and she, a lot of children, and she lived in New York State. In 1827, however, it was outlawed for people to be slaves. However, she had to run away with her youngest son because she was so wonderful and so extraordinary, they just did not want to let her go. She was motivated, motivated by her religious vision. And at the age of 46, she left New York with 25 cents in her pocket and her youngest child in a new dress. And she started a campaign against slavery for women and everybody else. She chose the name Sojourner Truth and she traveled and she from place to place telling everyone that slavery was over. Sojourner was a powerful speaker. She was often compared to the orator Frederick Douglass. However, she cautioned Frederick Douglass for always talking negative and talking down and saying, don't you believe in God? There is a God, we're going to be okay. Things are eventually going to be okay, was one of the things that she would always say. People thought that she had a mystical effect on the audience when she talked. She was very believable. She was very convincing and tell them everything is going to be okay. And even though many, many times she was physically incarcerated, that means put in jail, she would continue to talk and talk and talk and let everybody know that things were going to be okay. She was a brave, brave woman and she would not stop talking and telling everyone that things were going to be okay. In 1863, President Lincoln abolished slavery. 
it was outlawed. It was illegal to have anyone as a slave, male or female. And she went from city to city telling people it's over. Things are okay now, it is over. But it wasn't until the Civil War that the South released their slaves. So Sojourner helped many, many people move to the North and she helped wounded soldiers and she helped people who had recently left slavery to get on their feet. She was called the freedom person. She helped free slaves. And she also helped people in the military get back on their feet. She personally talked to President Lincoln about the Emancipation Proclamation and the fact that it needed to be broadcast all over the world to make sure that everybody knew that slavery was over. After the Civil War, she also continued working on women's rights. That was her big deal. She wanted to make sure that women were treated equally. She dedicated her life to opening doors of freedom to all people. Sojourner published a narrative in 1875 and she lived until she was 86 years old. Wow, she spent her whole life helping other people and she lived until she was 86. And her big deal was to make sure that it was equal equality for all people, equality, especially for women. So I want to congratulate Sojourner Truth, Freedom Messenger, 1883. She was born in 1797 and expired in 1883. Thank you, Sojourner Truth, for your campaign to help others, equality and women's rights. Sojourner Truth, another famous Afro-American. Okay, so the next person that we're going to talk about today is another woman that lived in the 1800s. She lived from 1820 to 1913. And her name was Harriet Tubman. She had a nickname though. They called her Black Moses. Let's find out why. Remember I said that the reason why I'm dressed like this is because this is the way that women dressed in the 1700s. So, so Harriet Tubman stated, I never run my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. With a small band of runaway individuals huddled together behind trees, Harriet Tubman would help people go to the North to get away from slavery. They would escape to freedom and escaping to freedom means that they were moving to the North. Now remember when we talked about Sojourner Truth, how she told us that she had to help people get to the North because in the South, they did not recognize the proclamation emancipation, okay? Harriet Tubman was born in Maryland and again, big family. She was one of 11 people. She took the risk over 11 times of helping people move north. And that's how she obtained the name Black Moses. Harriet returned to her plantation. She 
came back and she got her sisters, her brothers, her cousins, even her mother and her father. She helped them move north to get away from inequality. Using an established route called the Underground Railroad, Harriet made 19 dangerous rescue trips to help other Afro-Americans. She helped them by providing them clothes, by providing them food, by having houses and friends along the way that would allow them to stay while they moved north. So there was a bounty put out for her of $40,000, which was a lot of money in that time for her capture. However, they never caught her. She was very smart and very intelligent. She led more than 300 people to freedom. And according to her, she never lost a passenger. Harriet received many honors, including the medal from Queen Victoria of England. It was a great freedom fighter medal. And those were her last years in poverty. When she finally received that medal, the government provided her a pension for nursing the individuals that were coming out of the Civil War. And she used the money that she was given to establish a place for aged people to live after they had left slavery. Wow, what a phenomenal person to take your own money and to make sure that others became free. And so that's why she was called Black Moses. Again, her name was Harriet Tubman and she lived from 1820 to 1913. She was born in Dochester County, Maryland. And her motto was, I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. So let's say thank you to Harriet Tubman for her courageous acts of kindness. Here again is another famous Afro-American. And remember this month, we're going to be studying women. So even though last month was Black History Month, we're moving into March with our studies on famous women of every culture. Thank you, let's have a great day. Hello students, this is September 2nd. This is Selling Through September at Rayfield. I am going to read to you today the Bill of Rights. I have a right to vote. I have a right to see a doctor. I have a right to go to church. I have a right to human discipline. I have a right to community actings. I have a right to talk. I have a right to education. I have a right to refuse treatment. I have the right to privacy and dignity. I have a right to make money. I have a right to exercise. I have a right to see my records. I have a right to own possessions. I have a right to receive service. I have a right to no discrimination and I have a right to no physically harm. These are your rights and you as students here at Rayfield, those are your rights here. So don't let no one take your rights away from you. I want you to listen to these rights because we probably going to be doing the rights, the Bill of Rights, 
throughout September. So the more we do them in each week, we would like for you guys to listen very carefully to your rights here at Rayfield, the Bill of Rights. The right that I am going to be speaking on today is going to be the right to go to church. You have the right to go to church. Church is a building where people assemble together to worship and praise God for his grace and his mercy and his goodness. No one has the right to take that from you. If you choose to go to church, that's your right. You have that right. You have the right to go to church. You have the right to learn about Jesus Christ, about his birth, his life, and his death. You have the right to learn about all the miracles that Jesus did here on earth. And those things you can learn by reading your Bible and by going to church. So listen guys. You have the right to go to church. You have the right to learn to love your fellow friends. You have that right. Because when you go to church. God is love. And he will teach you how to love each other. And he will teach you. How to love your friends, your peers, your teachers, your mothers, your fathers, your group home leaders. God will teach you how to love them. Because see, by taking care of you guys, we love you so much. So go to church. Listen to the word of God. And learn how to love each other. Don't let no one take that right from you. One day, you may even be the pastor of a church. You don't know. You don't know the plan that God has for you. So by going to church, you can tap into something. You probably can tap in. Hey, you don't know. You can, might, just might be the pastor of a church. You have the right to go to church and nobody have that right to take that away from you. That's your choice. You had a choice to pick the pastor that you want to listen to as he teach the word of God. That's your right. No one can take that right away from you. It's yours. So go to church. Learn about God. And learn about his grace and his mercy. Church is where you can grow. You can grow in faith. You can get faith, and faith will keep you going when you feel like giving up. You'll have hope to hold on to. Worshiping, praising, and glorifying God is the place to be. So remember, there is a I that is called ADA. It is an American with Disability I. It be came a law in 1990. It is a civil right law that prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities. You have rights. And one of those rights is what we are speaking about here today. You have the right to go to church. So don't let no one take that right away from you. And don't let no church discriminate against you because you have a disability. That is not how God works. You have the right to pick the church you want. You have the right to pick the pastor that you want to preach to you. So keep that right in mind. You have the right to go to church. Listen to your bills of rights each week. Try to learn them. Get them in your head. So that you can know what your rights are. You have the right. You have many rights. And I read them to you at the beginning when I started reading. So each day I want you to try to learn 
and to remember those rights. Because those rights belong to you. You 